Well, it's interesting in terms of what the predictions have for the weekend. It's a three-day weather report and with warnings from the Nigerian Meteorological Agency that we are to expect thunderstorms in parts of the country for the next three days. I must tell you from experience that in the FCT Abuja yesterday, the rains stayed through most parts of the day. I don't know about you, but I hope you're bracing up, especially in line with coastal areas and states that have experienced some sort of flooding. We'll talk about the relief in terms of the activities on ground, but we hear that over 11 billion naira has been donated to Meduguri flood victims, and most recently, the First Lady, Senator Remy Tinibu, donated 5 million naira as well. But before we get into that discussion, let's introduce our guests in the studio looking to review issues in the news. I'm now joined by Barrister Elias Ofo. Good morning to you, Barrister. Good, Good to morning. see you. Good morning, Bito. Good to see you too. Now, let's begin with one of the controversies greeting the newspapers this morning. As a lot of persons are divided over the position of the EFCC and the insistence of the ex Kogi state governor, Yahaya Bello, who is insistent, and we saw a picture is captured on the Daily News Hub in the company of the current governor, Governor Usman Ododo, claiming to have visited the EFCC office headquarters in Abuja. And uh, there are two sides of this story now. The EFCC is saying he is not in the custody. He is still a wanted man, but he's insisting that he was not interrogated upon his appearance at the EFCC office. But the main bone of contention is the allegations bordering on 80.2 billion naira money laundering saga. What do you make of these developments in recent times? Anyway, it's just the usual imbroglio. The usual thing we're here in Nigeria... Um in terms of uh, crime investigation, prosecution, and all that. Um, yes, uh, pictures were seen, actually. Um, uh, even all over the social media, uh, you would uh, uh, see the governor in the company of the, 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 his, uh, his, uh, his uh, predecessor um, walking into the premises of the EFCC. So it beats one's imagination what transpired. If he was in that premises and he was not interrogated, or he was not investigated, he was not questioned in any way. I, I don't know what Nigerians will make out of that. But you would equally know that, um, 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 I don't know, the, 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 the law is made for certain people in terms of the stringent nature of the law. I'm a lawyer. I've appeared in EFCC. I've gone for clients. I've, I've, I've begged on my knees for a client whose crime um, was not fatumable, was not even a prima, nothing could be made out of it. There's no prima facie evidence upon which investigation could stand. I've pleaded on bended knees for him to be admitted to bail. And they told me categorically he cannot go. So I wonder a crime of that magnitude. And the man walked freely into the premises and then left saying he was not interrogated. It's not debatable whether he went, and went there. He was there. Everybody, Nigerians saw him going there. So what happened? Is it that they were so busy, there has been a whole lot of hullabaloo about um, what crime he committed. Nigerians deserve to know what transpired. The EFCC should tell Nigeria what happened. We were so busy that we couldn't interrogate him. We have invited him to come another day. Instead of coming to the Republic public that he's still a wanted man. What are we going to believe in this circumstance? Now, now it gets even more serious as his official spokesman has put out a publication saying, should anything happen to Al Haji Ayabello, the EFCC should be held accountable. Do you, do you think it is becoming more of a media trial or is this some gimmicks to uh, tilt away from the major issue on the table? I don't know, but it seems like all of the above. It looks like all of the above. Because there should be a categorical statement coming out of the anti graft agency addressing Nigerians as to what is going on. You can't come behind to start saying he's still a wanted man. The man made it clear. He was walking if every, I don't know, nothing was photoshopped. Now, many people are asking, is this a case of shared immunity in regards to the presence of the current governor, Governor Usman Ododo, who still has immunity in office, unlike the ex Kogi governor? Do you think that this is the case at B, that the EFCC's failure to take him into no custody way. is owing to shared immunity? The law is very clear. The law is very, very clear. Um, um, Ododo is Ododo. Um, what's his name again? Yeah, yeah, Bello. Yeah, yeah, Bello. You cannot tell me because he was working in the company of the uh, of the former governor that um, immunity still covers him and all that. I don't understand it. Which law is that? Is it Nigerian law or which law are they talking about? It does not apply in this circumstance. 
he could be arrested. I am not saying that he's a must that he should be arrested. He's still presumed innocent until proven otherwise. But information is key. Nigerians should know what is going on. This is where the public domain. The FCC was coming out to tell us that, yes, we have tried to investigate him. He's nowhere to be found. Now he's been found. Now he's been found. He walked into the premises of the anti-graft agency. And walked out. And walked out freely. And you now come to tell us that um, um, there's still a case against him. We didn't interrogate him. He's still a wanted man. I don't know how you, you're just going to tell that to the mountain for crying out loud. I, I don't understand it. Now, now, is this in another way the case of individuals being stronger than institutions? That's exactly another pointer. That's another side of the pendulum. That's what it is. I give you an instance. A client of mine, I admit him to bail. He was refused. I was even, in fact, when I walked into there, I mistakenly entered an office that I was not supposed to enter. I remember vividly the kind of backlash I got. I knew how embarrassing it was. The woman there didn't take a light over me. And then demanding to see my client, it was a Herculean task. Like seriously. I now started talking about Bill. That was a no-go area. So, of course, he, he, he's an ex-governor. So what do you expect? No, truth be told, he's an ex-governor. So that's what it is. So, so th that brings me back to my question. In line with prosecuting offenses bordering on financial crimes and allegations of graft, the law provides for the EFCC, empowered by its mandate, to go after such highly placed officials. But despite having left office, it almost feels as though the unity clause is still very much around him. Now, is it a question of the EFCC leading a court order to further carry out an arrest on, on this nature, or would it be involving the Nigerian police in this jurisdiction as well? It was made clear. EFCC said they were going to go headlong against him. So what else are we talking about? And the EFCC chairman also swore that if he fails to bring Definitely. him to book, he now might you're, resign. Now you're talking, but there's a precedent here that is almost being established. I remember somebody was telling me, I think an, an old, older colleague was telling me, no ex-president had ever appeared before any inquisition panel or anything. Look at Amephiele's case. Buhari has a case to answer. Yes, he should talk to Nigerians. He's the role he played. The man is now a paria, a paria person. He's been bandied about about what he did and what, did, what he did not do. What about the, the, the incumbent president? What about the person that gave the orders on, on, upon which so many things happened? The man made it categorically clear that he was, he was obeying a constituted order. So we should hear from him. Nobody should, should, is saying that he should be bundled into prison. But let him address Nigerians as to what transpired. He shouldn't be the man alone carrying the cross. After he took orders, after he played some roles uh, in, in effort, concerted efforts, in, in collaboration with, with, with people um, that he worked with. We should hear from necessary people. That's what it should be. I don't know. I know that we are fighting corruption, actually. But then, let the writing be done. Let there not be secret cows and all that. Let, don't give us the impression that some people are somehow, some jumps ahead of the law or some jumps above the law. So uh, we, we don't, we don't, um, we don't um, make so much noise and they do so little. This is not advocating for Yahya below, uh, 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 arrest, uh, arrest in, in arbitrary way. Do, nobody's saying that. I am a lawyer. I know what it is. He's still presumed innocent. But... Tell Nigerians what is going on. Do the right thing. Interrogating him doesn't mean you are overstepping or overshooting the tarmac. You're not doing that. We, ca we can't run with the hand, hunt with the hounds. We can't speak so much and then do so little in, in the, in the so-called uh, anti-graft uh, moves and all that. So that is just exactly what Nigerians are saying. Well, Barista Elias of four feels that the EFCC owes Nigeria the due diligence of informing us on the true position of the alleged 80.2 billion naira money laundering saga and the invitations to the ex kogi governor is he in custody is he not was he interrogated and can justice seem to be done in the matter or well, whilst this continues to remain one of the prominent headline features this morning let's look at another that has also continued to draw different reactions now ahead of saturday's election the people in edo state will march to the polls but it's been quite heated on the political party front with the PDP failing to sign the peace accord. Well, this morning, another angle to the story is in terms of the electoral umpire's preparedness. INEC has pledged that unlike what happened at the presidential election 2023, the Edo off-cycle election 
would follow strict guidelines in the use of beavers, with 5,000 beavers deployed and over 18,000 ad hoc staff also involved in the elections. Now, by Stylas of all, we looked at the election amended act and uh, the role of the INEC chairman in making those promises, much like he made last year. But this year, he's saying that it will take more efforts for the elections to be seen to be fair and credible. Are you satisfied with the level of the involvement of the Nigerian Air Force and the deployment of BVAS ahead of the elections? Anyway, it's just the usual thing. The, the, the thing about Nigeria is that uh, we don't conclude until um, we start seeing a manifest, um, manifest outward manifestation of um, what has been uh, imputed into anything. At least um, the last election, a, a lot of promises were made. The last general election, a lot of promises were made. We, we, we saw the outcome at the end of the day. Nigerians expected so much. Presently, people are saying they're not going to vote. And I read in the news that it turned out voter apathy was equally recorded and all that. People are no longer interested. The summary, the only thing I'm going to say is that the Electoral Commission should up their game. They should do what is reasonably necessary to avert this apathy that is breeding. It is snowballing. It is getting out of hand that... In due time, you may not see any Nigerian on the polls. That is what it is getting to. What is happening in Edo is still another litmus test. All hopes are not lost. That is the thing there. All hopes are not lost. Now, the other angle to this is the three-horse race that a lot of people are looking at now. Of over 10 candidates with quite the following in Edo State, only three, based on the current political party structure, again, given the nod in a three-horse race, we have the PDP, uh, likes of Mondeo Pobelo, we have the likes of LP's uh, Akpata, who has received backing by the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, ahead of these elections as well. But the challenge seems to be the position of accusations thrown across the table. Many are accusing the security forces of compromising, tilting towards one political party. We also saw the visit of the CDS, who still reassured the Edo State Governor of the dedication to ensuring that there are no security breaches ahead of the poll. What do you make of all these allegations thrown across the table? It is always there. The security architecture of Nigeria, we had always advocated for a rejig. And of course, you know, the police act had been um, passed, police bill has been passed into law, um, so to speak. It's just implementation that is remaining. Um, if you do the, yeah, they said it's only the madman that do um, that does the whole the, 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 the whole thing the usual way and expect a different outcome. Things have to be done differently for a desired outcome to chance. That is just what it is. Um, there is no way you don't expect something different from the previous general election in Nigeria. That is one no, number one uh, uh, thing point you have to you, you have to you take the cognizance of. That is that is Nigeria um, where, where things continue to um, uh, repeat itself. We know what happened in, in Lagos in, in the last election. We know hap what happened elsewhere and all that. Uh, are you expecting something different in a do state? Mm. That's the thing there. That, no, that's the cardinal question to answer. It's a big question. And the yes. antecedents of the off-second elections in Nigeria, one thing to note that most Nigerians in rating the elections, it seems as though there's been more trust in off-second elections in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the fairness of the elections as against general elections. Do you think that uh, because it is a state at a time or a few states at a time, there's more concerted efforts in terms of boots on ground for election monitoring, election supervision and whatnot, and it brings to question the question of having all our elections in one day or having more off-second elections in some state? <laughs> When we we'll go this direction, at times I ask myself a lot of questions. We have the personnel, we have the resources, we have the budget. A lot, a lot of billions have been quoted in previous election. So I do not understand. Is, is it the inertia? Is it the concentration of personnel or more manpower to, to handle uh, electioneering uh, uh, activities uh, during, uh, in a particular day? Um, the point I'm trying to make is if there's no conscious effort towards efficiency in a particular thing. Um, you, you don't expect anything different from what has been happening. That is the thing there. And Edo, um, to an extent, let me agree with you that because there's, there will be a concentration of, um, of, um, of, of uh, mindfulness, um, there, there, will be, there will be more, I don't know, uh, um, 
people people are going to have their eyes on on a do so that would um, um steer up steer up more 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 mindfulness more efficiency to, so to speak um but that is not all that is not all if you are not looking at correcting certain errors of the past in the present thing you don't that inertia is not going to work the inertia will be dissipated with the same factor that better built the previous ones that is the point i'm trying to make in simple terms a door may not be a different if what is supposed to be done is not done that's the thing there taking lessons from the past look at INEC. I know I cannot come to own up to say, um, let's agree, let's admit that there were mistakes here and there. They have never they have never said that. It was blamed on a technical That pitch. is a thing there. Everything was Charlie. Everything was Charlie. And that is typical of Nigeria. That's why um, I'm signing, sounding this, uh, it, it looks cynical somehow, but, but that is what it is. If you're not acknowledging, if you're not um, um, countenancing certain things that deviated from the standard that made you deviate from the standard then the present one you are going to be complacent you are going to just make it business as usual that's that's what it is and that's what part of the problem we have in this part of the world nobody takes responsibility for anything in other times you see people resigning because of major blows because of major blunders and all that but here it doesn't happen nobody admits that he has made a mistake it's just the usual thing we can just speak grammar and then that's all. Nobody is held accountable. We had bad fuel, nobody t is held accountable. We have the other one, nobody just goes on and all like that. And then the same people come to raise their shoulder high. They are the statesmen and women. They are the people, their forces to reckon with and all that. Responsibility, accountability is gone. So how do you now tell me, because there's inertia, because there's concentration on this particular state, then what played out in general election is not going to happen again. So that's, let's, let's ask ourselves the necessary questions. Now, item number three on the list is the visit of the CDS to Governor Godwin Obaseke. And it's more on the approach in terms of uh, boots on ground. But many are asking, since we're transitioning to the use and deployment of technology for our electoral process, can we borrow a leave from what you legal practitioners do in terms of e-voting? Do you think that this amount of money is invested in deployment of security, deployment of beavers, can also be somewhat translated into the use of e-voting, even at general and off-circuit elections, to ensure fairness, credibility, and a reduction in the number of voter intimidation or apathy, as it were, in our elections. I agree with you completely. But the problem, number one, technology. Number two, the stage at which that technology is going to be deployed. And all that we know we lag behind in terms of information technology uh, in the committee of uh, nations of the world and all that outside there even the least countries you expect to be um maybe engaging in this kind of process uh, are already doing it that is one thing nigerian population number one number two the data the kind of data we have in nigeria data security and the rest of them data management is a very big problem in nigeria remember even the NIMSI, even the national identification management had been had been had been somehow uh, an albatross in recent time there's data leakage here and there data theft i don't know what term um the the, the experts are using about it but i know that um, our our identities have leaked we know companies that are even the so to speak allegedly buying data from some of these agencies the online the, phishing the sites. online phishing sites and the rest of them so how do we at this point trust this how are you sure that hackers will not go in and rig this election and then it will become deja vu, even worse than what we've been seeing? I do not know, but the bottom line is that we have to start from somewhere. I would probably advocate for a, a hybrid mechanism. That is if data could be well managed. If it's not well managed, you will see double voting, triple voting, worse than what we have experienced in northern Nigeria, where they tell the people infiltrate and then they are accepted and you see minus voting and the rest of them. I had, anyway, I'm not sure. But there, are still, I did, there, are still, there are still allegations. There so. are the allegations, but it has never been investigated. Nothing has been said about it if, in the appropriate quarters. Nigeria has not been addressed on this particular issue. Even with the voters' the register, uh, there have been talks about the need to update the voter register to remove names of dead voters that continue to appear, and then some persons also using each other as beavers. I remember the case yes. of twins in the general election who said that they were able to use each other's 
uh, voters card despite the beavers not being able to identify their differences yes uh, do you think that some biometrics need to be also deployed to strengthen what we have with the beavers currently that only uses facial recognition mm, that could work that could work actually um i don't know how experts are going to do that but some of these things are still compromised in the old time, you still find out that it's been compromised. It's, it's still not managed effectively. But the bottom line is that we just need to start somewhere. The BVAS is a step ahead anyway. And then some other technologies that are, are, are being deployed. I, I worked as a pool clerk back in the days. I knew how, um, um, how um, I don't know, analog I would call it. It was, yes. Um, to a, a certain extent, the consciousness to attain certain height of credibility and maintain efficiency made it work to an extent. Even though so many other things that better build that election and all that, which I witnessed as a child was a surprise to me. It was a shocker, actually, to me. I wouldn't be saying it on air. That's, that's as a young man, what the very first time I saw Nigeria, that is just it. The first time I saw Nigeria, I'm not going to say the date and anything and all that. But we pray our children are going to, and we would live to see better days in this country. That's what I'm going to say. And all that. That's what I'm going to say. The, you know, the bottom line is that we just need to start somewhere. The infractions and all that shouldn't deter progress in terms of technology and the rest of them. Because that is where the world is. That is where the world is and all that. I'm an academic too. I, I once told my students that, or rather my colleagues, I was telling them that the, 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 the AI has come to stay. We should think ahead. What should bother you should not be <laughs> whether students are using it. What you should be mindful of is how better to use it. If you shy away from it, technology, will, the, the history will drop you. Let me just leave technology aside. So that's the way it is. <laughs> now, moving away from technology and focusing on the human components, the discussions as it concerns political parties and the roles they play ahead of elections has also been underscored by the current activities of the People's Democratic Party, PDP. Now, it's a subject of discourse on the party's position in line with its National Working Committee on either to keep or suck, the party chairman Damagun has also somehow been tied to the Edo elections. Now, whilst the PDP again has made headlines in Edo for failing to sign the peace accord, many Nigerians are now analyzing the structures within the party and the next direction, especially in terms of shaping the political landscape alongside the PDP, the APC, and other political parties. Now, this is a big debate. Many are talking about the fact that the party seems to be falling apart. There are conversations also targeting the current minister of the FCT, Bryson Yeson Wike, and his role with the APC and how it tends to affect the outcomes in the Edo elections. But in terms of the party chairmanship, what do you make about the NWC's move to sack Damago? Anyway, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the truth we have to um, come to terms with is that... Um, there is a big issue in PDP. That's the thing there. Mm, I wouldn't say the party has to do the test of time and all that. But at this point in time in Nigeria, um, what is happening is expected. That's the thing there. The big players, the big players are playing second fiddles. That's the thing there. And however you look at it, somebody like Yeson Wike is a big player. But the second fiddle he is playing to an extent will definitely affect the party. That is quite um, um, that is quite glaring, very, very glaring. Um, in the last session, I told uh, your, your colleague that um, I'm not seeing Wiki as a, as, a, as a PDP member. I'm seeing him as a PC member. So truth be told, I've never seen any part of the world where politics is played in that way. I am not saying that um, the party should expel, expel him or the party should uh, declare him personal non grata. Um, he has a constitutional right to go about the party business the way he wants to do it, in as much as he's not violating any, any law. It's left for the party to know if their own code is being violated by the minister. That is the thing there. As for the chairman, yes, um, his predecessor was embattled too. I remember when the heat was on, he bowed out. That's the thing there. But only um, the party members and the caucus, the inner caucus, only them know what will be the fate of the of the incumbent chairman in this debacle um that is the thing there but just like i said um politics interest aggregation interest segregation and all that people coming in to champion one cause and uh, and the other and all that um uh, it has it, been there it's been it's been um synonymous with uh, party politics but the bottom line is 
PDP is bifurcated. That's the thing there. Now let's talk yes. about this factionality which you just made mention yes. of. And it's along the lines of a common phrase that is thrown around by a lot of political actors. After the elections, they say electioneering is over, it's now time for governance. But the governors, all through their tenor, are always somewhat distracted about the loyalty in terms of where the national working group of the party is leaning its allegiance ahead of the next election circle. Now, using the PDP as a case study, the Bauchi state governor, Bala Mohammed, has some sort of grip on part of the party's national working committee. Uh, there was reports that they met yesterday on Wednesday. Whilst the likes of Governor Shea Makinde, Governor Ademola Adeleke, are backing the current PDP chair, Damagum, this is also affecting, many would say, their attentions to issues of their respective states. Do you feel like that the electorates are somewhat forgotten after their votes are delivered and we leave the political actors to play around their loyalty to whatever course they choose to follow, other than keeping their eyes on the ball? Mm, yeah. They, just like I said, um, it, it's, it's been there, it's been there. We are not seeing anything new. That is what I'm saying. We are not seeing anything new. This thing had played out in the time past. When PDP was incumbent and other parties were oppositions, we saw similar things and all that. Of course, you know what happened in, in the, even Labour Party. You've seen how it's bifurcated too. And they are trying to pull things together and all that. The thing is that your you, party loyalty, most of the time, especially for governors that still have future ambition, cannot be taken away. That is the thing there. This is what is going to determine, are they staying or are they leaving? They need to test their feet. They need to test their feet. It's just like the game of Gongo Gongo, without this guy. <laughs> <laughs> out there, out there, there has been people that say, what is a Gongo Gongo and all that. They didn't understand it. I'm a koi man. And I explained to them, I said, Gongo Gongo is the, is, the, is the sound of the elephant hoof. That's what it is. It's not just about the song. That's what it is sounding while the tortoise kept uh, deceiving it. That's what it is. So they need to test their hoof in, uh, in, in, in their party to know whether they fit effectively well. However you look at it, these people still have their ambition. That's the thing there. Then I, I, it's, it's, it's characteristic of Nigerian politics that you can easily deflect to another party. So they test it and check, is it stable? If it's not stable, let me have my way in the other, other side and all that. I remember when uh, Gotswell Babio, the president, uh, as in the president, um, uh, defected from the PDP, defected PDP to from the APC. PDP to APC. It was like a child's play. I was one of the people that was, that was so surprised at that. I don't know why, but it, it, beat, it just beat my imagination. As in, I, I was like, these are the major people that this party was looking up to. I don't know how this thing happened so easily and all that. Then, then the president walked uh, minister, um, 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 the former Omahi and the rest of them. So you want to test consolidation. You want to test how stable you are here. Then the party allegiance, interest, and all that. Is it going to favor my future ambition? If it's not doing that, then let me start looking at um, the other side. That's the thing there. And of course, the, the, the FCT minister, you, you know what is going on. He might not really come or, or immediately to declare that, um, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm done with you guys. Let me make it very clear. And in his speech, I can imagine him saying, yes, Nigerians would know that I was no longer here. It's just now that I feel it's convenient for me to make it very clear that this is where I am. So, I don't know. Politics, politics at times, at times becomes funny. But, but that's what it is. That's what it is, actually. Yeah. Well, it's a very dicey political landscape in Nigeria, much like Barista Elias of what has cited a defection from one political party to the other, despite having different ideologies. Now, the PDP governors reportedly are divided over the decision with a bid to sack the current national chairman of the party, uh, Alhaji Elias Damagum, but he has the backing of some governors, the likes of Shei Makinde, who was in the company of Damagun and Governor Demola Deleke at the flag of ceremony for the remodeling of the Ibadan Airport yesterday, talking about the Samuel Akintola Airport, which is projected to cost over 41 billion naira, which Governor Shea Makinde is adamant that he would deliver next year. Now, leaving political issues, greeting the front pages this morning, let's look at a human angle story, one that has been characterized by disaster. Following floods in Borno State, there are controversies as to what caused the flooding. Some are blaming it on climate change. 
Others are faulting the lack of attendance to the Alao Dam, which reportedly some sections had cracked, leading to the spillage of water that has overflowed communities in Borno State, leaving over 1 million persons affected. But now in terms of humanitarian aid, there are reports that the amount of donations since the floods occurred up until now have hit 11 billion naira. Most recently, the First Lady, Senator Remy Tinibu, donated 5 million naira. But despite this money is donated, persons are concerned about the dangers of diseases that are said to be affecting those in IDP camps. Now, let's get your thoughts on this sad situation in Borno. Um, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's just uh, so sad, to say the least. Um, actually, when the news, when I got the news, I, I, I was like, this should not be happening, especially in the point of, point of time. And considering the proactive governor of um, uh, uh, Bruno State, I know Zulum, actually. I know him personally. I know his capabilities and all that. I know what he's um, uh, capable of doing. Uh, when it happened, I know that probably something went wrong because he's someone that's very proactive. He knows what to do and he knows how to um, region ahead of time and all that. But then, um, the humanitarian issues again, it looks like things coming back to us again. We are just out of a, a conflict, Close, closure of the IDP camps and all that. The IDP camps are being reopened again, which, which is a very, a very uh, uh, disheartening situation and all that. Yeah, the fear of disease, the fear of outbreak of epidemic and all that is, is, is looking us in the face as far as medical uh, flooding is concerned. Um, I think efforts uh, should be channeled towards that. Efforts should be channeled towards that in terms of evacuating people that are still submerged in one way or the other, creating a place that will be uh, uh, free for them and all that. And I think the governor, the government itself is not doing badly. International communities have had their beginning to come in. Shipment from Dubai, I think I read it in the news, and the rest of them. Then medication, like you're trying to say, medical supplies should equally follow suit in, in a proactive way. Um, in a way that um, to, to, to forestall a situation where there will be an outbreak of epidemic from, from the stagnated water and the rest of them. Um, it's unimaginable. What I read was 70% submerged, which, which is a very major disaster. It's catastrophic. Catastrophic. That's, that's the right word. Catastrophic. But let's go to the basics. The cause of this, I know that you have to chase away the wolf. First, before you start blaming the lamb or the fowl, that's the thing there, is, is a common African saying. But then we cannot um, uh, stop talking about this usual thing in Nigeria, maintenance culture, and then be proactive in terms of certain things, trying to prevent one or two things. I know out there, when you hear about um, hurricane and all that, you start seeing evacuation, people are being evacuated ahead of time, and it still happens, and then you see humanitarian disaster, you see a kind of this scales of devastation. Yes. Disasters at times take you unawares. That's the thing there. But when these things are foreseeable, we should step in to do what we're supposed to do. I don't know if this particular dam had been examined before. People going in to check it, experts that know about it, check it to see if this thing could be um, uh, forestalled, if this could be prevented, so to speak. I don't know what had happened. But the scale of this particular uh, uh, disaster shows that something was definitely wrong. Wrong. What was supposed to do to a very great extent, um, um, maybe maybe they, they were not done. They were not done. That, so this this is a, another aspect that we have to look at when we are talking about this uh, same thing because I, I, I very much, much agree with yes. you. I, I, one of those questions that has been unanswered is the fact that despite reports of amounts budgeted yes in the previous administrations for the building of counter dams yes. on the one hand, particularly for the Lagdo Dam, which we're seeing reports that the Lagdo yes. Dam is soon going to be yes. also opened yes. in the coming weeks. Is the challenge that the People's Parliament has not done oversight in ensuring that that project is executed to forestall the overflow of water into communities? Do you yes. think at this point, after amending this, or say, reactive approach to it, before the next wet season, the People's Parliament should have the honours to invite those concerned with this and ensure that we have a projected timeline on which these dams would be constructed. Absolutely, absolutely. Talking about then the ecological fund. I think I read something about the yes, ecological fund. Yes, over four hundred billion. So, 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 so these are the things. These are the things. These are an area we should look at critically as Nigerians, not only Meduguri, not only Bruno State, other places in the country. 
At times I ask myself the same question. You see the same thing happening over and over again. Next year you see over flooding in a particular year. The other year you see the same thing. Is it that something could not be done? If people have built houses on the waterways, the safety of the people is a supreme law. Do you understand? It's a of the people who have started that particular Latin maxim here a lot of time. They say to the people is the supreme law. Salus Populi as Supreme Alex. You have to, whatever law that they, that they have uh, clinged onto to say we own this particular property and all, if they're built on the water when in violation of this law, there's no buildings, buildings be removed. Then the, the, the highest thing that could happen is for the people to be relocated. The life and safety of the people should be paramount above every other thing. That's the thing. There should be a, a strict enforcement of, of whatever of whatever uh, 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 whatever law or whatever uh, urbanization law uh, that, that that is in the state to create waterways to evacuate whatever thing is a congestion uh, congestion uh, uh, then uh, drainages should be opened and all that. So that's what it should be. Now we have a little less than 10 minutes with two more stories to look at on the Daily Trust earlier. We looked at the sad occurrence in Zamfara State with a boat mishap. And uh, the question was now, whilst we can't really place blames, there should be a level of consciousness in the hearts of those who transport themselves on water and a responsibility on the Nigerian inland waterways to provide regulation with life jackets, training for boat operators, especially at times when the water level is high like this, but it almost feels like a recurrent decimal. It might be Zamfara today, might be Kogi tomorrow, but the challenge is with enforcing regulations within the Nigerian inland waterways. The sad occurrences of boats capsizing, overloading, people plying the waters without life jackets. What can be done to maximize regulations in that space? Mm, anyway, there are two sides to it. The laws review of the laws because i know some of these laws are very archaic the fines there you find out probably there could still be two naira as a fine then that law becomes automatically ineffectual because if there are no sanctions backing up a particular prescription people are not going to be compelled to obey the law yes, except on the moral angle that you know there is i owe humanity this then let me do it but then it goes beyond that if that is the case then why 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 is the law there that's the thing there why is the law there so the law should have a good arm. The law should have a good sanction, not excessive, but reasonable. That's what it should be. It should be reviewed to make it current, to make it in tune with the realities of the time, to make it standard in the committee of nations that pass similar laws. That's what it should be. That is on one hand. Number two is implementation. The people to implement the law, the law enforcement agencies should be on their feet. Do you think we can have a work. replication of what we have on the roads with road safety? Can we have more like a team deployed now, on now, the waterways? Now you're talking. Now you're talking. Let me give you an example of the way we do things in this part of the world. What I'm trying to say, this, this, we should check the peculiarities of our country to make things work. It shouldn't be just the model, the way it is. Give me a little time. Let me tell you what happens on the on the on the on the on the road, on the on the way. I I I, I had issues with some traffic warden the other day. There were congestions ahead, and you're here telling somebody he has beat the traffic. You are not clearing the congestion. The leaves are covering the traffic light. The potholes are diverse. The potholes are terrible. Some of them, if you jump into that, is either your tire gets removed or your vehicle somersaults. And the traffic warden is taking advantage of it to stop you to ask you your papers. What is wrong in creating a marshal that could hold a spade to cover minor potholes? We are Africans. We are not Europeans. Yes, we do, let's do it in our own way. They have their trunk arrowed and all that, asphalt, well asphalted in, 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 in every, every highest standard. But we don't have that here. There could be a marshal on the road safety that is checked up. Let it be probably the school sat holders. Create a, create a particular section that will be doing that. Cut off the leaves that are blocking the traffic light and fill minor potholes. Instead of standing there like sentry men. Looking for who to stop and, and probably where are the, where is this, where is that, at times asking inconsequential questions. Let's do things in our own way. There could be Masha on the waterways. You saw what happened recently, the, the, the celebrated that died the other time. That he Junior could, Pope. Junior Pope. Yes, that was a very avoidable death. He was not, he felt the jacket was dirty. That's what I read in the news. If the marshals were there, probably they could make sure that the, the jackets are kept neat. And then ask him to put on a jacket, put on a life jacket. 
It is an offense if you don't do this and all that. Then the boat owner will going to find you if somebody rides on your boat without a jacket. We do it our own way. That's what it should be. So, so it, w let's find a way to it just the, the review of the law, then the enforcement. Two sides of it. Enforcement in our own way. Enforcement in our own way. Yes. Well, the last item in the news this morning is another issue affecting every Nigerian, and it's the debate of how much of your income is spent on food. A big challenge this morning. The Guardian looked at it from the angle of a reported 200% price hike in goods both online and in malls. Now, the NBS published its reports for the inflation rate in the month of August, pegging it at 32.15%. Many say it's a gradual decline of what we had in the previous month. But despite that challenge, the current price of PMS and the attendant inflation in food inflation is making households lament. It's a continued conversation. Many are looking at the CBN saying that it's the only body empowered to somehow reduce the rates through the MPC cuts. But the challenge is whilst these debates are on, the average Nigerian man does not understand the grammar we're speaking in terms of inflation and MPC and is only looking to be able to cater for family and four. Mm. This one is a burning issue presently. I don't know how to delve into it. At this point, everybody's beginning to complain. It beats my imagination when I saw somebody up there complaining about it. And I said, what is a common man going to do? What level of complaint do you think is going to be coming from those quarters? That's the thing. There. What is happening now is, is, is something I can't even describe. Uh, at this point, uh, I, 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 at, a point at times, I, I get so dumbfounded because it's, on, it's inconceivable, so to speak. Absolutely inconceivable. Honestly, just like you said, whatever grammar, whatever technicalities um, are around these policies, um, the bottom line is that it's brazen. At this point, it's, it's overbearing on Nigerians. That's the thing there. I'd always said it. I've been said it in different quarters. Create enough safety nets. We are not really feeling the impact of whatever safety net you're creating, the, 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 the CNG, the electric cars, and all that. I, I, I don't, I've not seen mine. I've not seen one myself. That's, a th that's, a just, that's just the truth. Even the 70,000 hour minimum wage. Even the 70,000 hour minimum wage. A lot of people are still complaining that it has not reached their doorstep. They have not hit their pocket and all that. The student loan, I don't know how it was working. These are part of the safety nets. But to an extent, they are still insignificant. That is just the truth about it. Before you embark on some of these stringent policies, these things should be manifest. Nigerians should get enough of it. They will be saying, yes, yes, I'm, I was able to do this, I was able to do that. I rode an electric car. It was CNG that brought me to work. It was this and that. It was that and that. I was able to access credit. I now have a business by the side. Oh, my son got a loan in, in school. That's what you should be hearing. That's what it should be. It should, it should not be what we hear in the news and all that. Honestly, the news is tied on Nigerians' neck, neck on the necks of everybody. It's not something we can continue. It, it, it beyond, it's beyond explanation. It's beyond explanation. But the thing is this. There is a mistake this government is making. The people are being taken for granted. The last protest, it was like, yes, we can read their mind. We can predict what they could do. But I tell you the truth, not in all cases. Not in all cases. If I have I've been to several countries, Nigerians are the least predictable sort of people. You can't predict Nigerians to that extent. That is one truth about Nigerians. You can't predict them. I know countries, I know you, I know this is going to happen. But forget it. When you want it to happen, it may not happen that time. But when you least expect it, when you least expect it, it's going to be cataclysmic. It, it, what you will see would, in fact, you, you will be like, I, I didn't see this coming. Now, now, the current administration repeatedly is asking for time and asking Nigerians to be patient. Do you think that this patience is fast growing theme? And uh, ahead of October 1st, which is also one of the purported dates, it's more on the position of what many are saying is it tilts towards the law to obtain injunctions to restrict public gatherings or processions in the names of protest. Which law, which court is going to give such injunction? Now, and we saw what happened in the uh, previous protest where yes. they were now confined to certain spaces. That could happen, but the court cannot deprive the people of their fundamental rights. No court will do that. This is constitutional democracy. You can't deprive the people the right to protest. What you could do is to make sure it's not 
out of hand. It's not violent. That's what they do. It's the duty of the police to make sure the peace is maintained. Yes. If Miss Crimes are going to hijack it, then do what you should do to stop it. Are you telling me if people troop into the street that they're going to protest, you'll not kill everybody because they're committing offense? Nobody's committing offense for protesting. But if they are doing what is illegal, then you go in and do what you're supposed to do. That's what it is. It is people's right to protest. But let it be a peaceful protest. That's the thing there. I'm not of the school that preach do not protest. What I say, do what you should do to maintain the peace. Let it be peaceful. I have the right to raise up a placard to say, I am hungry, give me food. Now, but, yes. now, another angle to this conversation is the role of the CBN. Many are saying it is very easy for them to come up with policies to float the Naira, to remove this and that. But when it comes to cutting the MPC rates, it almost feels as though they are scared of hurting the purse of the government than hurting the purse of the common man. <laughs> exactly. That's what it is. That's what it is. And of course, who pays the piper dictates the tune. Yes. They are not doing it in isolation. Their works are not going on in vacuo. The government is still the government. That's what it is. Government will do everything they want to do uh, to make sure whatever policy they are targeting is, is formulated in a way they want to do it. That's the thing there. Um, the, the thing is that I do not know. I've said it right from day one. I don't know who is beating this drum. It looks like from international circles, this drum is being beaten. I don't know where... Um, uh, I don't know. As if um, it looks like a rat race. It looks like there's, 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 there's a speedometer somewhere reading for the helmets to say you must reach here or you must reach there. Or you must do it the other way or you must do it this way. I had always preached. I know that upon history, we had um, been fooled for so long. We've been stagnated for so long. But that doesn't mean people will die for there to be a cataclysmic, cataclysmic change. For there to be a sudden transformation into El Dorado. It doesn't mean people should be wasted. It doesn't mean people should be killed for that to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's the thing there. You have the button. Your duty is to make sure what you're supposed to do, you do it. Hand over the button to the next person. He continues the race. But what I'm seeing here is probably I want to do this. It's just like a, 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 football, a, a, football, a, a footballer that is um, trying to dribble everybody to score the goal, not knowing that he should pass the, mark, the, the ball to make it easy for him or her. That's the thing there. I am saying it should have a human face. There should be a sequence. There should be a system. It should be systematic. What should be done should be done. You do not ignore the people because you want this scorecard to read to a particular number. It, yes, you should equally it should have a human face. That's what I'm saying. It, it looks like... Something you just don't care. Let's just do it this way. Let's reach that height. That's what we're targeting and all that. Nobody's pointing finger. Nobody's saying that the government is inefficient. What we're saying is you should have a human face. You should look down to see the plights of the people. Take it easy. Take it, make it systematic. Have a road map. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, I don't know, it shouldn't be like a rat race. You're trying to impose tax. You are coming back to increase the price of fuel. You are going there to say this one, the VAT should be raised up. You are coming behind. The other one is saying the other one. All anti-people at the same time. All anti-people at the same time. Let us be sequential. Let us have, I don't know how what other word to use about this. It, it's too much on the people. That's the point. It's just too hard on the people. Let's have a human face in this whole thing. Let's look down a little bit and see the people at the lower ebb. Let's see the yearnings of Nigerians. That is the thing there. We're all educated. Nigerians might not even understand what is going on. We know, yes, policies in the long run could benefit Nigerians. It is targeted towards moving us into the next level. That is the thing there. But then the president, Mr. President, it is not a must that you do this thing in, a, in one year and all that, or two years. Look at the people that you are governing. See what is happening to them. Let them have some respite. You have said it in the beginning, let the poor breathe. Let the poor breathe, for crying out loud. Let there be a little bit of breathing, for goodness sake. Take it bit by bit. Take this one and take it to the end. Don't take everything at once. People are going to die. Well, by the last of all, we must thank you for your vehement appeal to the government of the day in line with the plight of Nigerians for it to have a human face. But this is as much as the time will permit for us to discuss local issues in the news. We appreciate you. Thank you very much, Peter. The pleasure, pleasure is ours.